So we're here to talk with Richard Bonning um, about the late Luciano Pavarotti. Um, thank you for your time. Um, your relationship with Pavarotti goes right back to the beginning of his international career, I believe. Um, do you remember the first time you saw him? Oh yes, I do. Um, it was a, he was doing an audition at Covent Garden in 1963, and I heard him then, and I was bowled over by the sound he made. I mean, it was a, a wonderful, natural, beautiful sound. And uh, I was putting together the Sutherland Williamson season for, for Australia for 1965, and I engaged him. And he came with us and he sang three operas a week for 14 weeks. So that, that was a good, good start. And uh, then we were in America and in Miami doing uh, Lucia. Uh, Corelli was supposed to be singing, and he, I don't know whether he was ill or what, and he cancelled the last possible moment, and they were without somebody to, to sing Edgardo. <clears throat> no, I suggested uh, Pavarotti. They weren't interested because he was not at that time a name. And Miami, Miami a good snow opera, and they wanted big names. Anyway, they couldn't find anybody that was free, and uh, so they took Pavarotti, and he had a, quite a success. <laughs> uh, was it a big voice right from the start? No. It's very interesting. It's, it, if you listen to it on recordings, it sounds like a very big voice. It wasn't a big voice. It, uh, it recorded very big. But in, in the theatre, it was a normal size tenor voice, but not big in the way that some of the, the Corellis and people like that, not, not any way to speak. And were all the top <coughs> notes and all of that, was that all in place by the time you, um, you first met him? Yes. It was, it was a natural voice. You know, I, I was in Modena one year and we had a dinner and his father got up and sang. And the old man sounded ex exactly like Pavarotti. I mean, it was just something, by, he had it by nature. I mean, we all know the, um, the kind of ebullient, larger than life um, Pavarotti, the showman that he, mm. that he became. Was, was he like that from the start? He was lovely at the beginning. He listened to what, what, what he was told, he worked hard, <coughs> excuse me, he worked very hard and he was great. It was lovely working with him. Now, was he a confident and performer? Up to a point, in, in, if it was in the Italian repertoire that he knew he was, he was fairly confident, he, did, he couldn't read music. And so he, he very much depended on the prompter and tended to stand on the stage with his eyes glued there. But <coughs> now he... he his great thing was he communicated with the public so well. I mean, he really, he, he got to them. And uh, I remember in, <clears throat> when he was in Melbourne, he did a couple of, or was it not Melbourne, it was later, in Sydney, he did a couple of Lelis et Amores. The first time was all right. The second time he got an encore for, for Una Forge of a Lacrima. After that, if he didn't get the, <laughs> the encore in sulk, <laughs> But he, 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 could, he could sing it. I mean, he, 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 he studied a little bit. He, he used to pester Joan to death, you know, how does she breathe and whatnot. And uh, she, she helped him, I think, quite a bit. But he, he, he didn't think about singing in, in any sort of physiological way, I'm happy to say. He sang on instinct, and, and it was a great instinct, which I'm, lasted him for a long time. I mean, he, he does credit... Dame Joan with, uh, oh, yes, with he was, like he was, breathing technique. He was always like very that, generous about that. Yeah. And, and did you work with him on technique? Oh, we worked all the time. I wouldn't say on technique, on interpretation for mm -hmm. sure. Because in, in Australia at that time he sang Traviata, Sonnambula, uh, Lucia and uh, Le Lise d'Amore, the four, three times a week. Not all four. <laughs> and uh, he, was, he, he was very popular and they, they loved him. We were lucky to get him at that time, right early in the career. Uh, and did you also work with him at Covent Garden? What was the first opera you... What you was the first with? one I did? It must have been Sonnambula, yes. It was already in 65. Mm -hmm. We did Sonnambula straight after the tour here. And he did, he did lots of things with us there, the Lucia and, and Traviata. And, did he do Traviata in Covent Garden? I can't remember. And uh, Fille du Regiment, of course. In abominable French, but <laughs> let that pass. <laughs> <laughs> and what was he like in the rehearsal room? For the first 15 years, he was an angel. After that, no comment. <laughs>
<laughs> so you work with him uh, right from the very in the good days. right from the very yes, start. Yes, yes. Um, I mean, yeah, you know, was he um, was he a, a great company member? Oh yeah, he, we we got I mean, it's fine. He got on with everybody. You know, I remember when we were out, he used to go on picnics together, and it was. It was good. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and in terms of kind of studying the uh, the dramatic aspect of uh, of a role, was he um, was he a natural actor? Did he work hard he, on that kind of? No, he didn't work hard at anything. He didn't know what the word, word work meant. Um, <laughs> but he he was a natural, a real natural. He, he was good on the stage. He went because he was. I won't say he was slim, but he was an athletic looking man in those days. Mm -hmm. He certainly was not as stout as he became. <laughs> I mean, it was the 1966 um, Daughter of the Regiment um, that earned him the King of the High well, Seas. Well, I mean, the High Seas were phenomenal. They mm -hmm. were right in, in, placed in the voice and, and uh, everybody was knocked out by them. Uh, and you conducted that performance? Yeah. Uh, did you know he had that? Oh, yeah, well, he had the, the, the top of the voice from when I first knew him. It wasn't something that was manufactured. It was mm -hmm. there by nature. He was very blessed by God with, with something here. Yes. It's interesting. He talks um, about uh, about having had a um, a kind of vocal crisis. Well, I think he developed a, a, a nodule, and he decided he was going to give up because it was it was it was all kind of going. He, he he felt too stressed by the whole process, and the minute he made the decision that he wasn't going to do it, when he started singing again, he freed the voice mm. up in a way. Well, that... I mean, like a lot of singers, he made some very silly. He, his his wanting to sing Otello and, and, and Pagliacci, ridiculous, because he didn't have the voice for them at all, I don't think. And uh, <clears throat> they were not successful, and they did him a lot of harm, I think. But, I mean, by that stage, he was into the big concerts and uh, making a lot of money. I mean, his two closest singing partners um, were probably... Joan Sutherland and um, Mirella Mirella Freni. Oh, she um, he loved Mirella. Well, they were born in the same town. They were, and I and I gather their their mothers worked in the same cigar factory. Oh, is that I mean, yes. no, 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 it's it's true. I I, yeah. I, I would imagine a kind of Carmen scenario with these yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. these two women rolling um, cigars together. But they went to the same singing teacher. I That's think, right. And, yes, um, yes, yes. and so they'd known each other. Mm -hmm. uh, she was um, she actually was successful a, a, a lot quicker than he was. I think she. Yeah. By and, her mid -twenties. And, and she went on a long time. She had a great career, Mirella. She was a lovely person. You know. Well, she and, um, said, she and Joan were, were very different uh, oh, singers, indeed. I mean, entirely what, different, yes. What, what, how, did, how did the kind of relationship between him and a, and a long-term vocal partner, like, uh, like those two very different prima donnas, how did, how did that work? I don't know. Well, you see, there were both of them very normal women with no, no great stresses in their character to... They were not competitive. They were very happy to sing. And if he sang well, they sang well or even better. And uh, I think he got on very well and very easily with them for a long time until he became a bit big-headed, shall I say. I mean, the repertoire he did with them, with them each was, was quite different, wasn't it? With, the, with Joan, it was very much the bel canto um, repertoire, which, um, which I, I was in a, in a sense, was earlier in his mm -hmm. career, mm -hmm. uh, although he always did the Verismo... Um, oh, the, in he, parallel with that, and that was well. As long when he stayed out of the heavy various most yeah. it was all right. But uh, the, when it got the heavy ones, he, he started to push, and that was not good. Yeah. But uh, no, he's uh, he, he was a, a good a good partner in, in the early days. When, I'm, when I say the early days, they sang together a great deal for twenty years, I think twenty two years, and and. It all stopped because he went wanted to do all these great things, or he was pushed into them, shall I say, by publicity people, into these enormous uh, what Joan called circuses in the arenas. And she did she did two of them with him, and she said, "That's enough. I won't do any more." And that was it. She she hated them because she said, "You can't make music. It's just in these huge spaces with a lot of microphones." She said, "I'll leave that to somebody else." He did um, by by doing that kind of um, uh, sort of arena performance. He did um, he did popularize um, his his art in. in well, he uh, popularized himself, which is I'm sure mm. what he wanted, <laughs> and good luck to him. You know why not? But uh, if he, it, it was a great tragedy that he did not learn to read music, and and uh, he had to learn everything by ear, and frequently I'm afraid he did not know his work because he was not and he was lazy. He was very lazy. I'm, I'm saying negative things, of course, but mm. he was also, there were a great deal of, of many wonderful positive things about him. 
I mean, you got to have it. When we did the, the Puritani together in New York, it was quite extraordinary. And there were, there were not many singers around in those days that had the range that he had, because he had the, the top of the voice right up to the D-flats, and, and his Rigoletto and Jonah did the, the Met together. What, quite wonderful. Were there works that, um, that you would like to have worked with him on? Oh, there uh, were lots the, of works that I wanted to do with all sorts of people, but, you know, it's, it's time and, and, and the opportunity to do them too, you know. Um, it was from the 80s that he started to tackle the, the heavier yeah. roles. Um, he was quite criticised um, for it. Um, I mean, do you think it was, was... Was that because the voice was never big enough for it, or was it... Um... Well, yeah, I mean, he didn't have that sort of a voice. He had a wonderful lyric tenor voice. And, and in trying to push into the dramatic repertoire, I think he, he, was, he made a mistake, as do many singers. Uh, had the voice changed over time, or was it... Not really. I mean, his, his, his singing career actually lasted 45 years, must Did have been. It really? I mean, it was, yeah, I was kind of, I know, I, I, I was... I remember 25. Is it, <laughs> I mean, his, his last concert was 2006, wasn't it? Well, he, probably, was, he went on a bit long. Yeah, yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so how do you think um, fame changed him? Enormously. In both ways. <laughs> I mean, he, he took to it like a duck to water. Mm -hmm. He loved it. I mean, I rem he, he would accept anything to, to be in the public view. I remember when we were doing Puritani at the Met, we had a Puritani on Tuesday, then he flew out to the other coast and did Johnny Carson show, flew back on the, to do another Puritani, and he was clapped out. <laughs> but I mean, it, it was, he wasn't always as serious as he might have been about about what he was doing. He didn't he didn't sort of stretch himself at all. I remember Decker asked me to um, record Werther with him. I said I'd love to record Werther, but I said he won't do it. Oh yes, he will. He's scheduled to do it in I think it was Houston. I said he won't do it. Oh yes. I said you want to put your money down. We had a bet. Well, of course I won the bet. When it came to the Houston performances, they put out. Mr. Pavarotti, in deference to his fans, will sing Le Lise d'Amore. Mm. Because of the French language, it was beyond him. I remember when we did uh, Favorita in Italy, way, way, way back, I wanted to do it in French because the original. I had to change it to Italian because he couldn't manage the French. But I mean, this is just, just a fact of, of, of life. And uh, the ro roles he did well, he did very well, very well. They were not, he was not an intellectual singer, thank God. He, he was a natural, natural, instinctive singer and a wonderful, wonderful one at that. Once he had a great deal of fame, and he did, I mean, he was enormous. He was probably the most famous opera singer on the planet for oh, sure, 20 years, sure, sure. probably. Um, did, that, did he lose an appetite for, for stage work um, at that time? Or? I would say he gained an ap appetite for making a lot of money. I mean, he was pushed into it by both the man in Hungary and the man in New York, whose names have, I'm sure everybody knows. <clears throat> and and they, they, they were making a lot of money out of him. And then they had the three tenors and all that stuff. Um, he did get quite a reputation um, for cancellations. Um, yeah. Was that, was that f uh, fair or unfair as a...? Oh, well, I mean, he, he cancelled. Some singers cancel a lot. and they. Um, and they shouldn't. <laughs> no, I mean, he, he didn't take care of his health, and, and that, that was the, the, the cause of a lot of the problems. To say he ate and drank too much. When I say drank, not alcohol, but he drank little fizzy drinks galore, you know. And, and, uh, I remember in New York, now I'm telling tales, he had a, a great refrigerator full of celery and God knows what, all, and, and bottles of water. And, uh, and he used to show it to the press, but he didn't show them the one in the other room, <laughs> which was full of, I can't begin to tell you what. <laughs> no, he, he, he became a compulsive eater, which is a shame, and did, certainly didn't do his health or his voice any good. I mean, you must have some fantastic um, Pavarotti moments. I've got some uh, terrible stories, but I don't dare tell them on television. <laughs> Have you got some? I mean, not not necessarily terrible stories, but just moments that that um, that that, that uh, you know, fond moments that where where you kind of get no one else would quite have done that the same way. Or 
I don't know. I remember all the terrible things. I remember <laughs> he had a birthday in, 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 when we were in uh, Bologna recording. That was, that was La Favorita with Cosotto. And uh, some fan brought him a birthday cake, chocolate birthday cake. It was huge. I mean, like that enormous chocolate cake. And it, and it was 100 degrees and no air conditioning in the theatre. And he offered it all around and we were all sort of looked at it and said, thank you very much. Do you know, in the one afternoon, he demolished the entire chocolate cake. <laughs> well, I mean, it didn't do him any good, that's for sure. <laughs> and um, what do you think his legacy is, looking back at it now? I mean, it's now 50 years since he first recorded for Decca, I think. And I think if people listen to a lot of his earlier records, they can learn a lot, because he did sing very well and very naturally later on, I don't know. Not so great for me. And um, in terms of stage performances, you, when you conducted him um, Copper Garden, you conducted him at the Met? The Met, all, all over America. We went to Minneapolis and Atlanta and everywhere. We did lots of uh, Fiji Regiment and Traviatas and... Uh, I mean, if, if, you had to, if you had to pick a performance um, that you conducted with Pavarotti. Oh, do you know, I don't know. People ask me the same thing about Joan. There, I did so many. How can I remember no. them? I don't know. Of course, I remember Joan's farewell at, at the Covent Garden when he and, and Luciano and, and Marilyn came and, and sang a little bit with, with her. That was very moving. Pavarotti was, I mean, he was like, like a lot of people. He had two sides. One was lovely and the other... And if you had to, uh, if you had to pick um, an opera and a role that you th that that was you think was the that the finest. Well, early on, he he sang Sonnambula very well because he was able to sing very lightly when he needed to. <coughs> I think the Rigoletto was very fine. I liked that very much. Lelizzi Amore, of course, was everybody adored him in that. He was he was charming. He had that acuteness on stage, you know, which was again natural. He didn't have to to work hard to do it. And um, if, there, if you could only have one aria sung by, by Pavarotti... I don't know. I have no idea. I don't listen to records very often. I, I don't know. What, what is this thing? Oh, I, we did so many, I don't really remember. <clears throat> I think in, during his life, he, start, he started to develop mannerisms. And a lot of the young singers that copy him copy the bad mannerisms. Whereas if they would listen to the early records before he got the mannerisms, they'd do themselves a power of good. I mean, did he um, did he base himself uh, particularly on any on any one singer that you that you know? In just in terms of the, uh, well, I'm sure, I'm sure he listened to all the old Italians before him, and uh, I mean the Corruzzos and Peratillos and people like that. He loved singing, and it was a natural function for him, but he was not intellectual about it at all. And the fact that he did not learn to read music, I think, was a great shame because he could have done much more with the repertoire because he was capable of singing huge amounts of repertoire and I mean as with Callas for example who revived all these wonderful big uh, Verdi operas at La Scala he could have done all that too but he didn't he didn't choose that way and that was because of the um the, the learning involved in the learning yes he had to be he had to be taught it by repetitive by ear and he of course he had a wonderful ear and he sang in tune, which is what a lot of singers do not do. And, and, and he picked it up. But, and that was all right up to a certain age. But, you know, as we get older, we learn slower. And it was the same with him. And uh, we, we, we were supposed to record Adrian Le Couvre together. And he turned out he didn't know a note of it. And, um, I mean, it's a unique voice. It's one of those voices that you hear it, you can immediately say it was, who it well, is. It's a great natural sound. So that's why he had a great career because he didn't have to manufacture anything. It was all real, quite real. And can you um, can you think of anyone who's uh, today who has that? No, Sam. <laughs> do you think there will be, or is that just is he? Well, I'm I'm old and I look to the past, perhaps, but no, I don't know. Maybe there will be. Who knows? There they may well turn up to be somebody, but you know, the young singers they don't get the chance to develop as they did in the old mm -hmm. days. And uh, I mean, in the old days, one used to sit with the company for seven, eight, nine, ten, and more years. I mean, people like Flagstaff, she didn't sing a Wagner until she was 39. Yeah. Nielsen didn't become famous till later. So many of them. I mean, by 1965, Pavarotti would have been 30, I think. Um, so, yeah. Which is, yeah, which I, I guess is, 
his late. I was kind of curious Pavarotti fact. Um, one was that he was um, that that um, his choir from um, from Modena um, they won the Ice Stedford I think in 1955, uh-huh. and that was one of his um, one of his kind of motivations to go on and be a be a singer. The kind uh-huh. of the excitement of winning that mm-hmm. competition with his um, a choir that his, he and his father sang in mm-hmm. in. Um, in Wales, of all mm. uh, of all places, yeah. um, but obviously it was a. Um, um, I mean, he studied. I think he studied for like six years before he even um, privately. Mm. I think because he didn't study it. Well, the, the teacher whose name escapes me now was obviously a very good teacher because taught taught Morella and, and other singers of that period. Yeah. So he, I don't know how much he had to learn. I think a great deal was by nature. That was the impression I got at any rate. Yeah. I mean, certainly the roles that he started off with were... Well, they were, were, they were the right roles for him. Yeah, Rodolfo. Mm. Uh, Rodolfo, yes, he was very good Rodolfo. Henry Galletto, yeah, yeah. Um, those kind of things. I suppose, um, I, I, they're not that they're easier than other roles for them, but they're, 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 presumably they're, they're parts and operas that you grow up. Well, he knew them from this high, yeah. you know. He grew up with them. <clears throat> and uh, as long as he was in his own language, he was, he was pretty happy, but... Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you very much. My pleasure.